proudly we hail... New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story today is titled, The Man from Mars, and it deals with a young soldier who learned that it's one thing to conceive of a war that will be fought with push buttons, but quite another to actually fight it. Our first act curtain will rise in just one moment, right after I talk to all you young fellas listening in. Fellas, let's talk about your future, and America's future. They're important to each other, you know, and to you. Today, your United States Army is charged with a vital responsibility. And to meet this responsibility, the Army is rapidly expanding its forces. They have a job for you. A job that must be done by men of courage. You can get full details of how you may best serve your future and your country's future by a visit to your nearest United States Army recruiting station. Learn all about the benefits you can have in the United States Army. Sometimes when I have nothing to do, which isn't very often, I like to think about all the men I've served with since I've been in the Army. I'm a hard man to surprise because I sincerely thought I'd seen everything. But it just goes to show you, as long as you live, you learn. The day I met Private Emmett Witherspoon, I immediately realized here is somebody brand new. The day I met him was a day like most other days. My regiment is stationed in West Germany, and we had just returned from the rifle range. How long you been in, Witherspoon? It'll be a year. Well, at least you've had training. Training? Training for what? Training for what? You're in the Army, Witherspoon, in case your country ever has to fight a war. You... I disagree completely with all the training I've submitted to. You do? Oh, most emphatically. I believe that none of it will ever be of any actual merit. Oh, well, that's all right, Witherspoon, as long as you don't object to taking it. Oh, I've... Decided to submit to it. Well, that's very nice of you, Witherspoon. Well, actually, you see, I had no choice. When I entered the Army a year ago and observed at first hand the archaic methods of training... Archaic? Oh, yes, definitely. Archaic, obsolete, outmoded. I wrote the commanding general a letter and outlined my views. You Oh, I'm sure he appreciated them. He was kind enough to reply. Mm -hmm. He said he was uh, uh, taking my criticisms under advisement. At this point, I can do no more. Well, you seem to be a man of parts, Witherspoon. Tell me, what have you got against the training in the Army? <laughs> when you have time, Sergeant Conway, uh, a great deal of time to listen, I shall be at your disposal. Uh, for example, I understand today the company went out on the rifle range. Mm -hmm. The rifle range. Rifles in this day and age, why not take the company out on the archery range or perhaps the spear-throwing range? Listen, did you at least qualify with a rifle with a spoon? Qualify? Sergeant, I fired expert. Uh, for your information, and it's on my service record, I scored a possible with the M1. I still think it's a waste of time. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, you know... Differences of opinion. <laughs> That's what makes life interesting. One thing I can promise you right out in front with a spoon. You'll find it interesting here with us. Very interesting. Well, that was my first meeting with Witherspoon. He was tall, thin, serious looking. Had some funny ideas. Well, he seemed all right. I went back to the orderly room to talk about tomorrow's training problem with Sergeant Emerson, and I walked into quite a scene. 
Our company clerk, Red Swanson, who's also in charge of the mail, was letting off steam on all cylinders, and his bright red hair was practically flying in the breeze. I can't get all my work done as it is. I got 50 million things to do without being a post office. I'm supposed to get the mail and give it off. Okay, it's my job. Did I ever complain? All right, slow down, will you, Red? It's all right for you to say slow down, Sarge. You don't have to break your back toting all that junk. This guy gets more mail than the rest of the company put together. Red, a man's got a right to get his mail, huh? Who says no? But look at all the mail he gets. It's like the New York post office the day before Christmas. You want me to get the mail delivered, Sarge? I've got to have at least two men to help me. Look at it, Sarge. Books, papers, magazines, letters, packages. Witherspoon, Witherspoon... I'm going to see that name in my sleep if I ever get any... Uh, uh, Sergeant, oh. I, I came in to find out about my mail call. Oh, you did? Yes, I was wondering if there was any mail for me. Get yourself a trailer truck and carry it back to your <laughs> barracks. What are you laughing at, Sergeant Conway? He, he's in your platoon. Where's he going to keep all this junk, huh? You, you think this is all, huh? There's another loaded regiment I gotta go back for. There was no room in the jeep this time. There's all this mail for you with his spoon? It's got his name on it. Sergeant, we gotta do something about this. That does seem like a lot of mail with a spoon. Hey, sir. As you are. Uh, Sergeant Conway, I'm glad you're here. I want to talk over the training problem with you. Yes. What is this? Oh, uh, a new man's been assigned to the company, Captain. This is his mail. Part of his mail, sir. You're Private Witherspoon? Yes, sir. Oh, well, I imagine you've been traveling a lot, eh? All this is back mail. It's finally caught up with you. Oh, no, sir. This is about what I usually get every day. Uh, maybe a little less than on most days. Uh. <clears throat> well, there's uh, no army regulation. Says man can't receive mail. <laughs> Uh, Sergeant Conway, I'd like to see you in about 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, did you say I had more mail back at Regiment Red? Uh, when do you suppose you could pick it up? Sergeant Emerson, there's maybe some high top brass in this army who have secretaries that do nothing but answer mail. But this guy has them all licked. He's got a guy who's going to have time to do nothing but carry his mail. Meaning me. Who's this from with a spoon? Your girlfriend? Not exactly. Mostly uh, brochures, magazines, uh, pamphlets, uh, reports, uh, tracts, monographs, and so on from scientific societies, uh, universities, academies, uh, groups I belong to. A, a great deal of it uh, comes from an organization of which I happen to be president. Yeah? It it's uh, the New Outer World Science Fiction Society. Oh, hold me back. Well, I might as well get this stuff back to the barracks and start reading it. Uh, uh, good night, Sergeant Emerson. Yeah, good night. Good night, Sergeant Conway. Well, after the old man had briefed us on the training problem for the following day, I went back to barracks. I wanted to talk to my new man, Witherspoon, for a bit. Hello, Sergeant. You looking for me? I was out to mail some letters. Witherspoon? I was thinking... I'd better have a talk with you. Certainly. Now, look, Witherspoon. You're a new man. You're coming into a good platoon. I want you to fit in here. For your sake and also for ours, we're a team here. Everybody has a job to do. And on how well he does it might depend his life, my life, everybody's. Well, I understand the value of teamwork, Sergeant. I want to talk truthfully to you. And I want you to talk truthfully to me. Sergeant, are, are you implying that I have been or might be telling lies? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Oh, no. No, I'm just taking advantage of some lessons most of us learned in combat. We found that the job we have to do can't be done unless every man is truthful. Not so much in what he says. But in what he is. It has to do with having respect for the man next to you with a spoon. Uh, having faith in his ability when the chips are down. Now, maybe the day will never come. I hope not. But if it does, we're all going to be in a spot where you either do or you don't. You follow me? Not exactly. On that day, everybody's life will be on the line. We'll all come out in one piece. We go in as one unit. 
That's what we're building with a spoon, one unit. And you're part of it. Just as important as me, as the old man, the colonel, even the general himself. Uh, do, do you always uh, take the long way around to make a point, uh, Sergeant? Look, you're in this outfit one day and already half the platoon thinks you're not. Well, that's their privilege. It's also their right. I, I might add it's one of the rights they're fighting for. For example, I even call you the man from Mars. Now, what is this? You're a machine gunner. You're in charge of an important weapon. You've got a serious job to do. People have to have confidence in you. They have to take you seriously. Otherwise, it affects their attitude. Sergeant. Do you realize what we're doing here? We're training for the past wars. If the next war ever comes, do you think we'll use rifles and machine guns? Do you even think we'll have infantry? We're in the second half of the 20th century. Where the spoon all wars have always been and will always be arguments over real estate. And you win them or lose them, depending on which side gets the men in there. Sergeant, you know as well as I do, should there ever be another war, it's all to be decided by just a few men pulling and pushing switches and buttons. Science today can develop robots who, who could replace infantrymen. I have an article here from the oh, National no, no, Robot no, no, Society. Look, 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 wait, Witherspoon, look at that wall. Come here. I want to show you something. There's a mirror on that wall. Look in that mirror, buddy, and you'll see somebody. You'll see the man who's still the soldier of the future. You! Well, Sergeant Conway, I guess we disagree. Well, sir, my man Witherspoon went through the motions of soldiering all right. And you couldn't fault him anywhere along the line. He did his job faultlessly. His equipment was always in tip-top shape. But his heart wasn't in it. Everybody thought he was nuts, and why not? He'd sit around and talk about all kinds of advance and developments. Scientists were working on a type of ray gun that would replace the rifle. They were perfecting a type of nuclear generator which could be strapped on a man's back and enable him to fly like a bird. They were developing what would be called a force field, an invisible wall of atomic energy that could prevent any type of missile from coming through. Oh, boy. This boy was loaded. And the mail kept coming in. Papers from all kinds of science fiction societies, books, magazines. He'd read them all. Keep us posted on how man as a fighting unit was on his way out. Yeah, it's good shooting with a spoon. It's eight targets out of eight. You can't do better than that. Ah, but what is it? A machine gun. In the next war, this will be as obsolete as the bow and arrow. Yeah, well, don't worry about it, huh? Listen, I, I don't know why I do these things for you. It's the man I want you to meet. The college professor. He's doing research for the Army. Really? Yes, really. He's a scientist. Believe it or not, the Army uses scientists. Happens to be in Europe on a convention. The colonel asked him to talk to the unit leaders about modern techniques. Was oh, that so? Yeah, and after the lecture, I talked to him about you. He said he'd like to meet you. Come on. Uh, you're not kidding me, are you, Sergeant Conway? Why should I kid you? Actually, the real reason he came here is because he has a son in L Company. His son? In the infantry? Well, why not? If it's good enough for you and me, it's good enough for him. Uh, Dr. Ye. Uh, uh, this is Private Witherspoon. Dr. Yates. Oh, I've heard all about you. Uh, Sergeant Conway has been telling me a few things about you, too, Witherspoon. I understand you are of the opinion you won't be needed in the event of another war. Or so Sergeant Conway has explained it. Well, Dr. Manning, your position should appreciate what the next war will be like. Well, in case there is one, Witherspoon, I'm not quite sure I could tell you anything about it. It's true we have developed new weapons. Oh, the nu nuclear weapons, Doctor. I'm glad you used that word with a spoon. The word nuclear, after all, refers basically to the nucleus. Yes. Well, I would say that the nucleus, or the heart of any weapon, is still going to be the man who uses it. Or the man who learns how to defend against it. Oh, why will we need men altogether, Doctor? Surely you must be aware of the great steps in... Developing automatic machines? I am aware of them. I may add that I have had a part in creating them. And I can tell you quite frankly, winning or losing a war will always depend on brains and courage. We have yet to develop a machine that can exhibit either or both of these qualities. I don't think we will develop one in the near future. As far as your rifle, your machine gun, and your grenade are concerned... 
They are still the most effective and efficient weapon for the individual fighting soldier. Well, <laughs> I've been reading a lot of science fiction. <laughs> well, so have I. And enjoying it, too, I might add. And I don't laugh at it. In my lifetime, I have seen too many so-called wild schemes become reality. Now, when I was a boy, there was no such thing as an airplane. The automobile was an expensive toy. You couldn't transmit your voice without a wire. Everything has changed. Well, sir, hasn't war changed, too? Not really. The weapons have become more powerful, and they will become even more so, but the essential factor still exists. You still need a group of men who must meet the enemy face to face. But why can't we just use machines? Isn't it possible to develop machines that can move forward and use weapons? It's possible, but it, it wouldn't work out. Besides, no machine could ever match the fighting machine we have now. The infantry soldier. Well, it, it's been nice talking to you with a spoon. I hope we meet again sometime. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Yates. All right. Well? All right. He may be a great scientist, but even so, I'm sure he's all wrong. <laughs> and you're right? Well, it's so simple. Sergeant Conway, why is it I'm the only one who can see it? <laughs> Today, your rapidly expanding United States Army needs intelligent young men with ability and ambition. Men intelligent enough to recognize the vital need for a strong armed force. Men with ability enough to be trained in a necessary job. Men with ambition enough to secure the future for themselves and their loved ones. Does this description fit you? Can you qualify? For full information on how you can fit in with the finest, check with your nearest United States Army recruiting station. Private Emmett Witherspoon, stationed with an infantry regiment in Germany, is a capable soldier, but his heart isn't in his work. Private Witherspoon, a devotee of science fiction, is convinced that man is no longer useful or necessary as a soldier. Private Witherspoon is of the opinion that nuclear weapons and automatic technicians will run any future wars. Platoon Sergeant Conway is having his problems with Private Witherspoon, whose ideas on the subject have earned him the nickname... The man from Mars. All right, at ease. All right, now listen carefully. Maneuvers have begun. This is the information I've just received to pass along to the platoon. We're in a war game. A regimental combat team from 2nd Division is playing the invader. Our regiment is defending this area. Our 1st and 2nd battalions are in the line. We're in reserve. Right now, we're expecting an attack. When it comes, our battalion will be rushed in to support whichever sector is under the heaviest pressure. As of right now, we're on the alert. No one leaves the company area. You've got to be ready to move out with all weapons and equipment on five minutes' notice. Any questions? Okay, back into the barracks. War games. What's all this going to prove, Sergeant Conway? Well, with a spoon, what can it prove? To you, anyway. I've been through two wars, and all I can tell you is they work out pretty much the same as maneuvers. Only for keeps. Hey, what was that? Platoon leader, on the double! Come on! Conway, Gordon, Grady, you're all here. What's it all about, Emerson? Wasn't there an explosion just before? The old man will give you all the details. Well, something happened? Oh, yeah, plenty happened. It's part of the game. Sir, the platoon sergeants are here. At ease, Sergeant. Well, they sure worked out a problem for us this time. That explosion you heard is part of it. That was a tactical type of nuclear bomb, and it landed on our motor pool. Our motor pool is now considered to be wiped out. We have no more vehicles. Number two, second battalion up in the line has fallen back under heavy pressure and needs reinforcements, especially a heavy weapons company. That's us. And the only problem is they're 17 miles north of us, and how can we get there in time? Carrying weapons and ammo and equipment, it'll take us close to three hours to get there. That's rough terrain to march over. But it has to be done. Now, if we can get at least one machine gun platoon and half our mortar squads up there quickly to support 2nd Battalion, they'll be able to hold their position. Or at least they can get enough covering fire to withdraw in good order. Now, 
What you're probably waiting for me to say is move out. Well, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Well, it's not that simple. There's a referee at battalion headquarters who's analyzed what the damage might have been, and it's bad. According to him, we've taken casualties. We have no vehicle. He says our personnel has also been reduced. We are to assume losses of officers and non -com. Now, get this. I am out. The lieutenants are out. The entire first platoon is out. The platoon sergeant and section leaders of second platoon are out. Uh, now, for some reason, he judges the mortar platoon is intact. That leaves Sergeant Grady as the only non -com. Uh, your platoon, Conway, is intact, but it has no leadership. Uh, who's your best first gunner? Well, there's no question about that, sir. It's Witherspoon. Well, Witherspoon's in charge of the platoon. Witherspoon? Well, naturally, all of us will go along, but we can only go as replacements. I want to see how this works out. I'll order one of Grady's ammo bearers to stay here. I'll go along instead. Uh, Gordon can replace one man in your platoon, and so can you. But we can only do the job of the man we're leaving behind. We can't assume any command function. Grady? Get your men up to the line. We can't travel together with the machine gunners because they can move faster. Okay, Conway. Tell your man with a spoon. It's his headache. But why can't we use the vehicle? I told you they've been blown up. But, 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 but why am I in charge? Because you're best first gunner. Now, they need our four machine guns on the line. Get them up there. How am I going to get them up there? Don't ask me. I'm going along in Hastings' place. I'll just be the number two gunner in the first squad, that's all. Well, I, I, I don't know what to do. I guess not. Oh, you're certainly a good one for talk. When it comes to action, you're not home. Look, you've been talking about scientific warfare. Well, it just happened. All your machinery's gone. It's been blown up. You're only left with brain and muscle. Well, at least have I got a map. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's about 17 miles, all right. I've got how many men? 21. 21 men. Each man will be carrying something, a gun or a tripod or ammo or spare parts, plus his personal weapon and equipment. Well, we have to walk. The best way would be to take the highway, which leads up into the mountains. Oh, no, no, we can't take the highway either. It's, it's a cinch. That'd be under fire. Mm. Oh, there, there's this back road. Holy smoke. That way's at least six miles longer and tougher. How would we ever get there? I don't know, but let's get there. Oh, all right. Uh, oh, lend me your whistle. Oh. Fall out! We took off along a rugged and hilly road. We had a long way to go, and we were loaded down. We reached the point that I'd seen before in actual combat, where the situation was entirely based on what a man could do with his hands and feet. Witherspoon may have had grand ideas of what future wars would be like, but to his credit, he was certainly taking this maneuver seriously. He was pushing the platoon along as hard as he could, but it was tough going. Finally, with a spoon called a halt. We'll never make it this way. Well, what do you suggest? Well, I'd like to think for a minute. A minute's about all you can spare. Science fiction was never like this, huh, with a spoon? I see your point, but it isn't helping. I have to figure out something. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we could attach a rocket to each man's back and just shoot the whole platoon up hey, there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. This road leads to a town, doesn't it? That's right. Has this town been bombed? I don't know. If we see a referee standing there, we'll find out. Well, I think maybe I have an idea. Okay, let's move out. Let's go. Uh-oh. There's a captain with an armband. He's a referee. What do you want to ask him? Well, since I'm in charge, you just wait here. Uh, sir, has this town been bombed? Not yet. Uh, thank you, sir. That's all I want to know. So far, so good. All right, men, follow me. Where are we headed? You see that place down the street? Yeah, what about it? It's the school. You'll see. I just happen to remember something I once read. In a science fiction magazine? No, in a history book. It worked once, it'll work again. Uh, just around the corner. What do you see? Hmm? Okay, men, hold here. There you see it. Park near the curb. A school bus. We're going to use it. Are you crazy? Wait a minute, why are you crazy? I remember reading about the First World War in school. The French saved the day by rushing troops from Paris to the line in taxis. Well, here's a bus. The referee said this place wasn't bombed. Who says we can't use a bus if we can get it? Oh, but we can't just take a civilian bus. Now, is this war or isn't it? We'll just make believe we have to take it. Oh, this guy looks like a driver. Uh, say, uh, do you speak English? Yeah. Uh, look, my friend, uh, we're on... 
maneuvers, see? Uh, uh, there's supposed to be a war going on. Now, if that were really true, we could just take your bus, understand? Yeah. Uh, but instead, what we want to do is hire it. Uh, Conway, lend me 50 marks, huh? Oh, boy. Uh, now, you know where Hanjusheim is in the mountains? Uh, yeah, I know. How about taking us up there for 50 marks? 50 marks? I do not know if I can return in time to take home the school children. Uh, you got another 25 marks on you, Conway? Uh, oh. Here's, a, here's a, uh, 75 marks. What do you say? I will make it. Okay, let's pile into the bus. Somehow we loaded all the men and the weapons into the school bus, and the driver took off like a scared rabbit. Referee who was stationed in the town kept looking at us and looking at his watch, and evidently what we were doing was legitimate because I noticed he couldn't help smiling at us. Well, we reached the 2nd Battalion CP in less than 20 minutes. Maybe the Major wasn't surprised to see a civilian bus pull up in a machine gun platoon pile out of it. He told Witherspoon where he wanted the guns placed. According to the way it worked out, the unexpected added firepower enabled him to hold his position. That result of it was that Witherspoon got himself a commendation. As the captain said later... Actually, Witherspoon, you accomplished the impossible. Nobody figured we could get the guns up there in the time it took you to do it. <laughs> I guess they learned something. Thank you, sir. Well, Witherspoon, let me ask you just one question. Could any machine have solved that problem? Uh, no, Sarge, I suppose not. Yeah. In a way, I'm glad, too. You are? Oh, machines are all very well, but as Dr. Yates said, only a man can think. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. When that problem started, it seemed so real to me, I became worried. Maybe that's why I figured out something. After all, no machine knows how to worry. Well, all right. Now that you've had your confidence restored in the human race, how about my 75 marks? <laughs> Ask most anyone what they want out of life, and the great majority of the answers can be boiled down to just one word. But one word is happiness. Well, now, happiness is a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but basically, I guess you might say that it's the achievement of your goals. To be happy is to be successful in whatever you do. And in today's highly specialized world, training is the key to success. If you're a young man of service age, you can get free training worth thousands of dollars by enrolling now in your United States Army's new Reserve for You training program. Under this plan, you can enter the course of your choice and be trained in such interesting fields as X-ray operation, photography, automotive maintenance, and communications. In all, there are over 100 courses to choose from. So for complete information on how you can benefit from this program, you visit your local United States Army recruiting station. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this radio station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army, and this is Richard Hayes speaking, inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>